I'd like to welcome everybody to another of our noontime lectures. Very nice turnout. Um, uh, my name is Chuck Smythe, and I'm the director of the Culture and History Department here at Sea Alaska Heritage. And I'd like, first of all, to make an announcement about an upcoming dinner at the Filipino Community Hall that celebrates the joint leadership and partnership between the Alaska Native Sisterhood and the Filipino community here in Juneau. And that's going to be on Saturday, August 29th, from 5.30 to 8 o'clock, as, as I said, at the Filipino Community Hall. So please spread the word and uh, think about attending. It's a great, great partnership there, and we'd like to be part of that celebration. Um, I'm happy today to introduce Mike Taylor, who's a Ph.D. candidate from the University of British Columbia, a joint degree in English and in First Nations studies. So that's kind of a neat combination. I'm really interested to hear more about uh, how those are integrated in his project. He's been here for three weeks conducting research in our archives and in the state archives uh, on the early years of ANB, ANS, and looking at um, institutional records like constitution and uh, records of motions and things, and he'll fill you in on that, but he's got an interesting title here called Onward Christian Soldiers, Situating the Writings of the Alaska Native Brotherhood, Sisterhood, Within the Longstanding Indigenous Literary Tradition. So I'm very pleased to have you here today, and thank you. look forward to your time. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here today. This is my first time to Juneau. I grew up in Utah, down in the lower 48, and currently in Vancouver, BC. And when I saw the opportunity to come to Juneau, I thought, I can't miss this one. So I'd like to begin by first acknowledging that we are on the ancestral lands of the Tlingit people. Um, and it's an honor to be in this building um, that attests to their survival and their continuing um, activism and co communal support to one another. Um, I'd also like to thank Chuck um, for inviting me to come here to do my research, and Nadine, who's been in the archives kind of collecting boxes in and out all day, every day for the past few weeks. She's been incredibly helpful. Um, I'd also like to thank Peter, who kind of has he's given me the... The, he's shown me the ropes of how the A&B ANS currently continues to work and the, the work they're currently involved in and introduced me to some really influential people that have helped to ground um, the, the scholarship that I'm attempting to do. Um, before I begin today, I'd like to I'd start kind of like with, with, kind of with my lineage um, and why I do what I'm doing. My, my mother's side comes from Germany. Uh, that, at that time, it was Prussia. They came to the U.S. in the 1800s. My father's side came with the Puritans in the 1600s from England. And you might think, why on earth are you doing Native studies then? <laughs> um, especially in this, this exciting era where indigenous peoples actually are starting to um, get hold of lots of those faculty positions within indigenous studies departments, right? And I did my undergrad in American literature. I went and did a master's degree out in Germany in American studies with an emphasis in American literature. And I went through those years of study in literature without ever once having to read anything written by a native author. I never once in five years of studying American literature had a native author on a syllabus in any of my courses. And so I applied to the University of British Columbia for my PhD with these really high hopes of getting in because it's a, it's a really big hub for native studies and in, indigenous, um, global indigenous studies, with the hopes that I might be a, an ally and a voice to recenter native authors and writers within kind of the, the iterations of American literature, right? So my goal is not to be another white guy talking for indigenous peoples. Um, but to be an ally that creates space for indigenous peoples to speak for themselves. Um, that's really the goal of my studies. So let me jump on then. I'm going to start with a, a couple of quotations. The first is from Thomas King. He's a Cherokee writer. He writes, Land 
If you understand nothing else about the history of Indians in North America, you need to understand that the question that really matters is the question of land. Land has always been the defining element of Aboriginal culture. Land contains the languages, the stories, and the histories of a people. It provides water, air, shelter, and food. Land participates in the ceremonies and the songs, and land is home, not in an abstract way. For non-natives, land is primarily a commodity, something that has value for what you can take from it or what you can get from it. <clears throat> and if you've never seen this book, I highly recommend it. It came out about a year and a half ago. It's a native history of North America. The next one comes from Gertrude Bonin. Um, this is from a letter she wrote to Samuel Davis. That name might ring um, or might be familiar to some of you as a, one of the early members of A&B. So she wrote this in 1927 after he had written her asking about the work she'd been doing in the lower 48. She wrote back, it is imperative to join hands, unite our forces to save our race from dying out by actual starvation and landlessness. So I want us to remember or have that in our mind today as I go through my studies today. I'm talking about literature, about writing. But I want us to remember that everything that we're talking about today has to do about land. So I begin first with the larger literary context. Again, I'm going to begin with a couple of contexts to set up what I'm doing. Um, the literary context is kind of what I see, what I've learned, in the larger academy of native literature or indigenous literature. It's not just native in the US. So though we have come so far, the current field of indigenous literary studies remains overwhelmingly focused on individuals and individual uses of traditionally Euro-Western literary genres. I don't know if you recognize some of these people like uh, Carlos Montezuma, Gertrude Bonin, Will Rogers, Lynn Riggs, and others. While analyzing the stories, poetry, essays, and other traditionally individualist literary genres produced by these few individual indigenous authors, the Academy has deemed as legitimate, quote, literature. However, most literary scholars overlook these same individuals' participation in the larger collectivist tribal and intertribal writings of their contemporary indigenous nations and networks. Such collectivist literatures, like the writings of the Alaska Native Brotherhood and Sisterhood, document indigenous individuals coming together in both their nation-specific and transnational struggles to define their relationships and responsibilities, as well as demand their rights as indigenous citizens within the United States. So my argument is that reading collectivist literatures reminds us that it is one thing to write to, for, from within, in behalf of or in remembrance of one's community and it is a completely other to write as a community. There is a unique power, place and purpose to each and I argue that there is an even more powerful place and purpose to reading collectivist, so r documents written by a community and individual writings together in their reciprocal relationship. So the Alaska Native Brotherhood and Sisterhood is only one of the many early 20th century organizations whose writings need to be recovered. Remembered and read as collectivist indigenous literatures published at a time when U.S. assimilationist policies had shifted from fraught treaties, forced removals, and outright war to more subtle though no less coercive tactics of individualizing indigenous peoples and property. Individuation has always undergirded U.S. assimilationist policies with the goal to remove indigenous peoples from the cooperative solidarity and familial, art, familial linguistic, spiritual, literary, and land-based communities. But on February 8, 1887, a new method of rapid indiv individualization was en enacted, reacting to what was then called the Dawes Act or the General Allotment Act, Alice Fletcher, who was a very prominent American ethnologist, and she was the leader of a group called the Friends of the Indians. She celebrated, the Indian may now become a free man, free from the thraldom of the tribe. This, this bill may therefore be considered as the Magna Carta, 
of the Indians of our country. Four years later, in his State of the Union address, Theodore Roosevelt, known not so much as a friend to the Indians, um, he forcefully reiter reiterated Fletcher's celebration. And he, he declared, the General Allotment Act is a mighty pulverizing engine to break up the <laughs> tribal mass. It acts directly upon the family and the individual. Under its provision, some 60,000 Indians have already become citizens of the United States. So you notice here the emphasis on getting individuals out of the tribal relationships, right? Getting them out of kinship relationships. Fletcher's simile of the Magna Carta and Roosevelt's metaphor of a mighty pulverizing engine demonstrate the hor horrific violence of the paternalistic politics that sought to break up the tribal mass by indiv individualizing indigenous lands and communities one acre and one Indian at a time. Such politics sought to individuate indigenous peoples away from the obligations and opportunities of collective kinship in order to melt them rather into the deracinating mass of individual U.S. patriots. My argument is that what has been perpetrated to indigenous lands has also happened to indigenous literatures. So we look at this again, these are the pictures of kind of the big names of early, 19th, or early 20th century indigenous writers. Um, and they're almost never portrayed with their communities, right? They're celebrated as individual American authors. So my argument is that they have been individualized away from communal forms of artistic, literary, and political conception, expression, and publication in order to be commodified like the land and assimilated into mainstream American literary and, or literature and literary studies. But such literary individuation did not begin with federally financed assimilationist policies or beating books out of starving, de-haired boarding school students. Rather, it began when well-meaning literary progressives began to recognize and long for what they called the primitive poetics of communal indigenous expression. It began when non-indigenous anthropologists, ethnographers, editors, and poets began to capture the artistic and spiritual expressions of indigenous communities and force them into an individualist forms of Euro-Western literary expression, and then attribute the final product to the captors rather than the original indigenous communities. It began as expressed in a 1917 edition of Poetry, a magazine of verse. And this magazine is known as kind of the catalyst of bringing poetry back into the mainstream and back into the Academy of the United States. Um, and the chief editor, Harriet Monroe, who again, many consider her kind of the mother of modern poetry, of this new experimentalist type of abstract poetry. Um, she concludes this, this magazine here that's dedicated to what they called Aboriginal verse with this. Vivid as such work is in its suggestion of racial feeling and rhythm, it gives merely a hint of the deeper resources. It is a mere outcropping of the mine. But although the mine exists with its stores of treasure, the danger is that the tribes, in the process of so-called civilization, will lose all trace of it, that their beautiful primitive poetry will perish among the ruins of obliterated states. This statement obviously is so problematic in many ways, and that brutal metaphor of um, a mine with literature, so the, the, actual, the absolute commodification of literary expression of indigenous peoples from literary elites, just like the commodification of indigenous lands. Since Monroe's call to arms, countless literary prospectors have gone to work individualizing collective indigenous expression away from indigenous communities and into commodities to be comfortably consumed by non-indigenous academics and literary elites. It was only when the traditional literary minds seemed to be drying up and the, quote, primitive became, began to become passe, that some individual contemporary, contemporaneous indigenous writers began to gain mainstream attention, but almost only as individuals who could be read to reflect the celebrated tensions, fractions, and alienation of early 20th century America. So indigenous literary scholars have begun to reclaim such individual indigenous writers and have started to connect them 
rather than forcing them into mainstream American literature, they began to connect them back to their communities. Um, there's one in, in particular, he's also Cherokee, he's a Cherokee scholar down in Georgia right now. Um, he came up with the term communitism, arguing that, uh, whoops, arguing that the connection between community and, re, and activism is the main, um, is the key ingredient or the key characteristic of indigenous literatures. However, he also argued that literature, especially when we're dealing with colonized peoples, should be, um, should be looked at or understood as the total written output of a people. Right? So not just the poetry and the prose and the stories, but the total written output of a people should be defined as their literature. Um, as revolutionary and as exciting as it seems for literary scholars, the, the truth is that most literary scholars continue to only focus, inclu including Weaver, um, who has this idea, only on the individuals, right? Only on their novels and on their poetry. So now let's jump to the larger Alaska Native literary context. Or I guess not the larger, the more specific. So as I've talked with a number of you and others, uh, many have been surprised at what I'm about to present. But this is the, the official academic record of Alaska Native literature that's taught outside of Alaska. Okay? So the current record of Alaska Native literatures is separated into two categories. Contemporary, which is around post-1960s, 1970s writers, and then oral stories, songs, and traditions that originally were co collected by non-indigenous ethnographers and anthropologists. Um, but thank goodness members of, of the um, in native communities here continue the storytelling tradition and the vital significance of those stories within their community. But again, the record is mostly, that has entered the academy, is mostly those collected by non-indigenous peoples, right? And translated, transcribed, etc. cetera. Um, the majority of them have actually been taken or recovered from the Bureau of American Ethnology, right? So they have to go and find them and re revive them but instead of acknowledging the indigenous communities, they continue to acknowledge the collectors, right? The Francis Densmores and others. So in one collection, this one is from James Rupert and John W. Burnett. James Rupert is a, a, a scholar of Alaska Native literature up at the University of Alaska. So he writes in the introduction to this collection, the collection of such material has, pro has proceeded for somewhat less than 200 years, but an exceptional body of written material has been produced during the last 25 years. Okay, so let's just pay attention to kind of the time frame that they put these in. The next one is from Joseph Bruchak, who's an Abenaki scholar. And he put together this anthology, Raven Tells Stories, focused again on Alaska Native literature. Writing, this anthology reveals the blossoming of the talent and energy of Alaska Native writers in the late 1980s and serves as a milestone in the development of contemporary Alaska Native literature. So he doesn't even deal with anything pre-1980s. He goes from 1980s forward, only focusing on that Alaska Native literature. Finally, this one, the Alaska Native writers, storytellers, and orators, um, they pulled together a really well-known um, indigenous scholar named Gerald Visner. He is Anishinaabe, um, one of the most prolific writers and scholars of indigenous writing. And he, he introduced this as native memories endure in the imagination of stories, endure in the tease of creation, tradition, and survivance in sound, gesture, and shadows in literature. Without wanting to downplay the vital significance of orature or the, wa the warranted celebration of contemporary, quote, blossoming or the important collection of stories these and other anthologies represent, limiting the pre-1960s literary record of Native Alaska to transcriptions and translations of oral stories, I argue, maintains the myth, the oft-repeated myth still, <laughs> that indigenous peoples of North America have always been only marginally and, and recently literate. Today I'm presenting a branch of my current dissertation project. 
which doesn't only look at the Alaska Native Brotherhood, but it looks at this idea of communities coming together and writing together um, throughout this allotment era and this assimilationist era of the turn of the 20th century. So the other two organizations I look at are the Hawaiian Patriotic League and also the National Council of American Indians, um, which was spread out throughout the lower 48. And it and did have um, camps and groups and networking going on with the Alaska Native Brotherhood, as I illustrated with the opening quotation. Um, the problem is that when these collections put forth the orature um, as the only pre-1960s writing, they don't emphasize that limiting the canon to orature continues colonialism, right? It's a continued tool of colonization to emphasize and overemphasize that indigenous peoples didn't start writing, let alone in English, until the 1960s and 1970s, right? So, my third bit of context. I promise we'll get into the meat here in a minute. Um, but my third bit of context is the historical context out of which A and B um, came, came into being. So, does anyone recognize this picture, what it might be? I guess you might be able to read the sloppy old writing. So on October 18, 1867, in Sitka, Alaska, the United States purchased the territory of Alaska from Russia for $7.2 million, which wouldn't buy you much in Alaska these days, right? By 1884, the U.S. federal government had provided Alaska with judges, clerks, and marshals, thereby thereby organizing the territory as a civil and judicial district of the United States on its way to future statehood. Within a few years, gold was discovered. Again, this is familiar to most of you, um, so I'll try to go through it quickly for those that it's not familiar to. Um, gold was discovered and 30,000 Euro-American fortune seekers came running to Alaska and joined what became known as the, the Klondike Gold Rush. In 1900, with this sudden shift of demographics, Congress passed official civil and criminal laws. They increased the number of judges and established a system of territorial taxation. All the while, U.S. assimilationist policies and practices from the lower 48 began to infiltrate the Alaskan Territory. Um, only one example would be the um, boarding school students. So mission schools and federal schools began to also infiltrate Alaska. Um, not only then, they had been going on, but became a more powerful um, influence here. All the while, um, all the while, the U.S. government continued to restrict and hold exclusive right to the land, the fishing, the fur trade. Um, the U.S. government had taken over every form of, of um, sustaining life, in a way. They'd restricted every form and began to tax without um, ever acknowledging, without ever consulting with the indigenous peoples of this area. So on November 5th in 1912, as many of you know, um, there was an educational conference. And at the end of this educational conference, um, the a and came into being, right? And it did so as a, a Sim Shin man, 11 Tlingit men, and one Tlingit woman gathered in Sitka, which was then the territorial capital of, of Alaska, to form the Alaska Native Brotherhood. And their purpose is stated in their original um, constitution, or at least the earliest one I've been able to find, which is 1917, was this. To assist and encourage the native in his advancement from his native state to his place among the cultivated races of the world, to oppose, discourage, and overcome the narrow injustice of race prejudice, and to aid in the development of the territory of Alaska and making it worthy of a place among the states of North America. Because of some of the decisions made to encourage the, quote, advancement from his native state, and the quote, making it worthy of a place among the states of North America, the A and B A and S continues to be accused by some for what has been read as its blind advocacy of unilateral assimilationism. Mm 
But rather than setting the organization aside and its writings because of their apparently pro-assimilationist politics, rereading A and B's writings through a contemporary lens of, individu of, of indi indigenous literary theory reveals an overlooked era of complicated Alaska Native individuals coming together to develop the adaptive strategies necessary to secure the right to individual adaptation for Alaska Natives, their families, and their communities. Sorry, I feel my voice going already. Got a long way to go. As Tlingit activist and educator Andrew Hope III argues, the changes brought by other foreign cultures were forcing them to make, quote, heavy decisions that would affect their people for years to come. It is through the A&B's writing as a collective Alaska Native body that the A&B and later conjoined ANS contemplated, determined, and then published these heavy decisions. Thus, beyond recovering the writings of the A&B ANS in order to broaden the literary history of, of Native Alaska, I'm also interested in how the A&B ANS published various writings as a collective body, as a community of Native writers. I'm interested in literary forms and genres of collective or communal expression that defy the colonial definitions of literature that have so forcefully individualized and singularized indigenous literatures away from their communities. So again, the A&B A&S began as a Simshin owner, a business owner, and I, I'm going to pronounce, I'm going to try to pronounce Tlinget, not like the Klinget or whatever I've heard, um, to, to emphasize the, the absolute nativeness of this organization. Even though it may seem awkward for me to be doing it and might sound awkward, I think the awkwardness emphasizes the nativeness of the, of the community. So I'll do it anyway. A Tlingit philosopher, a Tlingit Russian Orthodox deacon, a Tlingit writer and survivor of the Carlisle Indian Industrial School, which was the first boarding school in the United States, federal boarding school for um, native peoples, a Tlingit politician, a Tlingit opera singer, a Tlingit all-native orchestra conductor, and a master Tlingit carpenter with no formal training or schooling. Alongside other Alaska Natives from various familial, political, traditional, and professional backgrounds, came together and began to plan, propose, and publish as a community of Native writers. These collectively authored writings of the early A and B A and S, many of which are only available here in this building, and a few over at the state archives. Um, you can find the, the kind of biographical sketches of some of the founders elsewhere and the history elsewhere, but the raw documents are only um, available here. So they include the Constitution and bylaws, or the many iterations of the Constitution and bylaws, because it has been amended um, continually, annual convention meeting minutes, resolutions, petitions, and newspapers that were all circulated throughout Native and non-Native Alaskan communities and their respective social and political structures. So now we finally get into the meat. Enough context, have set it up, we jump into the constitutions. These are a few of the different versions of the constitution um, that you can find here in the archives. So my exploration begins with a close analysis and critical complication of one of A and B's earliest collectively authored texts, the Grand Camp Constitution. Again, maybe some of you know of an earlier one. The earliest one I've found documented is in 1917. The Constitution is organized into 11 brief articles outlining the organization's purpose, membership eligibility, officers, revenues, and so on. And rather than discounting the Grand Camp Constitution because of its overtly assimilationist tone, my hope is to tease out some productive alternative interpretations of the most problematic phrasings in order to illustrate the complex, quote, heaviness of the adaptive decisions that were under consideration at the time. To begin, let us not forget, as an Abenaki scholar, Lisa Brooks reminds us, and she's based up in upstate New York right now, that indigenous constitution writing in the Americas is not merely an adoption of a Euro-Western form of contractual and political expression, but rather it's actually a, a long-standing indigenous literary tradition that dates back through the Quiche Maya Popol Wu, and even earlier to the Haudenosaunee Great Law, 
which was, um, some argue was as early as 1090 AD, others 14 something. Um, everyone agrees there was before European contact, right? So the A and B constitution can thus be read as an adaptation of an indigenous literary tradition through Euro-Western constitutional conventions in order to create a productive space for both acceptance and resistance. Um, and this argument is that whenever indigenous people write, the automatic assumption is they're copying a Euro-Western literary form. What I'm trying to do today is to present evidence that they are also adapting indigenous literary forms that have lasted long before, or since long before European contact. Um, although they may look very, very conventionally Euro-Western, um, I think it's productive for ongoing indigenous writing and activism to remember that these are a part of a longer history that predates Euro-Western contact and colonialism. So, Nevertheless, the Constitution itself, as already noted, is littered with problematic rhetorical and constitutional choices, including the organization's mandatory conversion to and proselytizing of Christianity, the assumed inferiority of Alaska Natives to, quote, civilized America, the exclusion of non-English speaking Natives from membership, and the push for universal American citizenship for all Alaska Natives. Many of these things have, of course, been dropped since the original Constitution have been amended, but that's how they were stated within the original Constitution. So first, the Alaska Native Brotherhood was conceived and heavily influenced by systems, structures, and schools of Russian Orthodoxy and American Presbyte Presbyterianism. The founders included, all Native, of course, but a Russian Orthodox deacon, a lay Presbyterian missionary, and an interpreter for the, for the Presbyterian Church. <clears throat> Since the beginning, A and B A and S conventions have commenced with a Christian invocation, and onward soldiers still rings as the, as the official anthem. Undoubtedly, and I've heard some very interesting stories of how that plays out in annual conventions. Um, undoubtedly, a number of Alaska Natives, both within and apart from the A and B A and S, embrace Christianity wholeheartedly. Others, however, surely understood participation in the church as an adaptive means to an end. Beyond questioning the devotion of their conversion, suggesting that either version of conversion makes, um, makes said individuals somehow inauthentic or disconnected from or indifferent to socio-political and cultural concerns of their peoples, which is often the narr narrative that surrounds converted indigenous peoples. Christianity... Um, sorry, jump back, suggesting that either version of conversion makes them inauthentic is a divisive ploy that serves continued colonialism over indigenous peoples. Christianity did, however, whether adopted devotedly or strategically, provide the organization a readier ear from the encroaching Christian organizations and governments. Thus, as Alaska Native Christian soldiers marching on to war, the A and B A and S were able to actively oppose American Christian imperialism through Alaska Native Christianity. A very cool irony, I think. In addition to being composed by converted Christians, the overall tone of the Grand Camp Constitution also seems to suffer from a severe inferiority complex. And we'll jump back to that purpose, the, the introductory purpose of the Constitution again. Readily admitting the need to, quote, encourage the native in his advancement from his native state to his place among the cultivated races of the world. Contemporary readers cringe at such subservient rhetoric. But rather than assuming their complete digestion and embodiment of, of colonial doctrines, why not question its use as strategic? Many minority petitioners, if you look back through the history of petitioning, um, they often include a self-abasing request because they see themselves as an unrecognized group striving for legitimation within a larger, um, often new political context. Perhaps some of the Brotherhood did subscribe to the rhetoric and consider Alaska Native traditions inferior to American, quote, civilization. But what the A and B A and S never did was allow such dominant and perhaps sometimes internalized beliefs 
subdue Alaska natives into passive silence. Instead, though the official, document, the, the official documents that enabled a and ANS to speak to non-native authoritative organizations are littered with assimilationist rhetoric, the a and ANS continually encouraged Alaska natives to stand up, to speak up, and to fight to ensure Alaska native rights to live, work, learn, and to the land. Perhaps most pro problematic is the Constitution's single sentence second article on eligibility. It reads, those eligible to membership shall be the English speaking members of the Alaska native residents of the territory of Alaska. Why would an emerging pan-Alaska native organization in its reaction to race prejudice, language loss, land theft, and so on, limit potential membership to the quote Americanized English speakers rather than openly draw from the experience knowledge and strength of elders and other less colonized community members. May, some of you may have other interpretations. My answer is, I don't know. I have no idea. Many organizations at that time did it. Um, but I do have a complication instead of just reading that as assimilationist. Right? So as Joy Harjo and Gloria Bird, two indigenous scholars again, they write, English literacy has been a tool of assimilation, a way to destroy cultures, a way to erase the past, a way to promote imperialism, a way to speak as though sovereignty never existed. However, there are more possible readings of this linguistic exclusion than the easy and reductive assimilationist reading of willing victims. The first is similar to the conversion to Christianity and the use of self-abasing rhetoric. In order to persuasively influence an authoritative English-speaking audience, the a and had to communicate effectively in English. English literacy removes the middlemen, the interpreters, with their long history of serving colonial interests. And as Harjo and Bird go on to argue, when indigenous peoples reinvent, as you'll see the title of their collection, Reinventing the Enemy's Language, when they reinvent the enemy's language, or when English is used to native purposes, the language becomes empowering. Though problematic, English has also provided many means of expression, tools to call for redress, a meeting place, a site to refigure what it means to be native or indigenous in a more global sense, and a site for potential change and alliance. Initially, lim limiting A and B eligibility to English speakers is problematic, a heavy decision indeed, but not necessarily an overtly assimilationist one. Um, I give another example, but I don't want to, I want to get into more of the other writings. Um, so I'm going to jump over the next example of what is often read as assimilationist and how I try to shift that discussion away from that um, to argue um, that these and many other critical and complicated calculations can be found in the collectivist writings of the A and B ANS. And such writings evidence the complex humanity and decisive adaptive strategies many early 20th century indigenous communities, also here Alaska Native men and women, decided to make in order to gain the power of self-representation. And as such self-representatives clothed in the colonial costumes of civilized Christianity, English literacy, and citizenship, the a and ANS gathered representatives from almost every village in Southeast Alaska into an influential community capable of securing a number of legislative landmarks in North America. And many of you know much more about the history of those, those um, and on the ground, ground realities of those legislative landmarks. Um, problematic, of course. Solutions to heavy decisions always are. And to say that A and B ANS has ever been or continues to be, quote, brothers in harmony would be inaccurately romantic. The most productive collectivism is always born out of heated discussions, differences, debate, and into and in turn, reciprocal compromise. A personal letter I came across in, in the archives down here in the basement um, highlights this reality. Uh, it's a very intense letter. 
It was written by President, or then Emeritus President of a and Lewis F. Paul, to the then President Cyril Zuboff, I'm not sure how to pronou pronounce that. Um, he wrote it in 1947. Let me skip over what I decided to skip. Get to the letter. He writes, my dear Sir Cyril, I wanted, to talk to I wanted to talk with you before you left Sitka, but you found it more important to spend your time at the Edgecombe School. We did not get together. Just what did you learn of the school? Did you learn that the boys are pilfering and stealing food? Did you learn, or sorry, that over $800 had been stolen? That those boys were put in jail? That stealing has been going on all summer? That much of the stealing that is going on is done by employees and the boys are blamed for it? That boys are punished by not letting them eat their meals? That one boy recently went three days without eating? That the food is poorly put up? That the flour is not clean and, the sli and bugs are seen in the sliced bread? That the small boy's matron uses a stick on the kids, contrary to regulation? That the girl's matron or advisor, whatever you call her, is incompetent and does not give to the girls the kindly care they need. Do you know that four patients were expelled from the sanitarium for being in girls' quarters, that they were given their clothes, taken to the Sitka side and dumped on the beach without money or a place to go, that they wandered around all night and one of the boys hemorrhaged, that one of the employees report reported this matter as being inhuman and he was fired for doing so. Paul continues, you talk of unity. I am at the point of declaring war and stating my facts and reasons to the camps. Okay, so I share this letter not to highlight A and B, A and S's shortcomings, but to highlight the heatedness of the era both within and outside of A and B. It is this anger at the experienced injustices and the internal disagreements from which the early A and B A and S writings were composed. Thus, the collectivist writings of the A and B A and S document the productive channeling of a collective anger into writings that need to be recovered in order to push back against the ongoing reductionist readings of early 20th century Alaska natives, the act, their activism as ardent assimilationists, and to develop a more robust Alaska native literary record beyond orature that shows that it builds upon orature and to recognize collectivist writings as critical forms of indigenous literary expression that continue to inform the quote heavy decision making of today's Alaska Native activism. But my goal today is not to enter into, into a conversation of whether or not A and B, A and S began as an assimilationist organization. In fact, the very conversation of whether or not Indigenous peoples are, quote, assimilated or, quote, authentic, is a colonial conversation that assumes unilateral assimilation rather than the strategic adaptation, as problematic as those adaptations might seem in hindsight, of intelligent Indigenous people working together to secure their own and their children's future. It is a conversation that divides Indigenous peoples and serves the ongoing colonial machine. Indeed, indigenous peoples everywhere have always adapted, and they continue to adapt to their ever-shifting political, social, and physical environments. My goal instead today is twofold. First, to illustrate how A and B, A and S built upon their oral literature by writing collectively and prolifically prior to what has now become known as the native renaissance of the 1960s and 70s. And second, to assert that when indigenous peoples come together and choose to write collectively, they do so as um, participating within long-standing indigenous literary traditions that have been documented throughout and beyond North America and predate, perhaps even inform, later Euro-Western iterations of those same literary genres. Just as A&B A&S's constitution continues an indigenous liter literary lineage dating back at least to the great law compo of composing, circulating, sorry, composing, circulating, and presenting petitions, whether in writing or some other material form, has always 
also been a critical way for voicing collective indigenous ideas long before European contact. Again, the Great Law is perhaps the most notable example. So I'm, I'm working from that as the foundation um, and showing how the Alaska Native and other Native organizations continue that tradition. So in the, Alaska, or in the Great Law, it states, a bunch of wampum shells on strings, three spans of hand in length, the upper half of the bunch being white and the lower half black, and formed from equal contributions of the men of the, first, of the five nations, shall be a token that the men have combined themselves into one head, one body, and one thought. The white portion of the shell strings represent the women, and the black portion the men. This string of wampum vests the people with a right to correct their erring lords. Here, strings are the paper, and the wampum shells are the ink, employed to represent the coming together of local men and women, quote, the people, to protest or to petition the action of their leaders, a right the Magna Carta, which was written in 1215, the most foundational declaration of liberty in, in, the in the Anglophone world, reserves exclusively for a group of 25 barons. <coughs> So again, that's the celebrated document of, in, of liberty and freedom, the right to speech, and so many other things. But the great law predates that with allowing all people to present petitions. Not only does the great law's constitutional right to petition, to petition predate similar literary rights in the Euro-Western literary tradition, indigenous communities within the United States have continued to adapt their petitions to their new nation-to-nation -nation relationships with the U.S. nation state. Often like the presumption that constitutions, petitions, or other collectivist literary genres have Euro-Western origins, however, early indigenous petitions or petitioners have often been overlooked to celebrate instead the work of their non-indigenous counterparts. As with one example of surely many others that are yet to be recovered, Tia Miles, a professor at Penn State right now, um, provides one example. She corrects the common misattribution that overlooks the anti-removal petitions written and circulated by Cherokee women um, back in the early 1800s. Those are overlooked and are celebrated, or in order to celebrate Catherine Beecher and, Lid and Lydia Sigourney, who are um, two well-known um, writers, American women writers at the time as the organizers of the first national women's campaign in the United States. So Miles writes, not only did the Cherokee women's organize action against Indian removal, which they did in 1817, predate white women's activism, which didn't happen until 1829, it may even have influenced the later campaign. By turning to the great law and Miles' recovery of the Cherokee petitions, I do not intend to devalue Beecher and Sigourney's critical petition movement, or even to argue about the origins of the, the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Rather, I am attempting to illustrate that when indigenous communities come together and they choose to petition their own or any other government body, they do so as part of and informed by a long-standing indigenous literary tradition. This remains the case even when the individual form of each petition evolves in order to adequately address each new audience and each new cause. Thus, when A, when a and B delegates from, south, from throughout Southeast Alaska gathered in Haines on November 25, 1929, and decided to publish and send a petition to every senator and representative of Congress, they did so informed by centuries of indig indigenous petitioning in word, wampum, and writing. And this isn't just a kind of a speculation. If you look through some of the minutes and some of the early speeches as well, you see that there's often this connecting of what we're doing is similar to what indigenous peoples have always done in North America. Um, they don't focus specifically on the writing or the literature, but on the organizing efforts, on the activism, and so forth. And here's that, um, that petition. So this petition that set... Um, this petition that set A&B ANS on a six-year path toward the Tlingit Haida Jurisdictional Act reads, 
Um, I have the, just, the, just the conclusion. So I'll read the first part and then show you the conclusion. Whereas the United States government took over Alaska from our forefathers, it was a land of plenty with rivers teeming with all kinds of salmon, the woods with fur and game animals, and forests were free to us. And whereas the United States government has locked up the forest so that what was formerly ours must now be purchased from a government that gave us nothing for it. And whereas our fish streams have been taken from us by the United States government so that we can neither fish nor live near our ancient fish streams, not only because in the changing civilization the same government has taught us to live like civilized people and not on a diet of fish like our forefathers, but also because our government, without giving us a hearing, has pro prohibited us from catching fish at our ancient fish streams for our support. And whereas the same government has made fishing regulations so that the only people who can catch fish with, the, with profit are those who can afford to invest for, from ten to $25,000 in a huge fish trap. And whereas all of this responsibility must be laid at the door of our own government. Therefore be it resolved that we petition in the name of the Alaska Native Brotherhood the, that great organization of our people comprising over 5,000 Native Indians in southeastern Alaska to the Congress of the United States for relief. And be it further resolved that Congress be asked to delegate a committee of fair-minded men to investigate our condition with money to get the evidence, uninfluenced by, different, by the different bureaus which are directly responsible for our condition. And be it further resolved that copies of this resolution be sent to each senator and representative of Congress of the United States with the hope that someday one may be touched to ask for justice for or ask justice for us. Notice the collective pronouns we and our. This declaration of unity expresses the collective protest of 5,000 Alaska Native adults and is but one of many of A and B ANS's early and ongoing collectivist writings that, like the ANB ANS's use of English, reinvents colonial literary conventions through a long standing history of indigenous petitioning for Alaska Native purposes. Because of this unity, ANB ANS was able to gain the right to bring suit against the United States, which enabled the later Alaska Native Settlement Claim, or Claims Settlement Act the largest land claim settlement in U.S. history up to that point. The next and final genre that we're going to look at is newspapers. In order to gain and maintain such solidarity and to keep their dialogic community connected, a and ANS had to decide on a way to further encourage the passion to petition as well as explain and disseminate the underlying problems, purposes, and potential paths forward. So then why, so they did what indigenous communities throughout North America have been doing since time immemorial. They adopted a system for circulating news between their various communities. Indigenous peoples have always maintained means to circulate news within and between nations. And again, we're going to turn to the great law and how it was done then. When a Confederate Lord dies, the surviving relative shall immediately dispatch a messenger, a member of another clan to the Lords in another locality. When the runner arrives at the settlement, the people shall assemble and one must ask him the nature of his sad message. He shall deliver to them a string of shells, wampum, and say, here is the testimony you have heard the message. It now becomes the duty of the lords of the locality to send runners to other localities, and each locality shall send other messengers until all lords are notified. So Haudenosaunee runners also carried messages between nations announcing the arrival of great men, sharing important dreams, and announcing invasions. My argument is that it is no coincidence that indigenous peoples decided to use the new technology available to them to adapt the way that they circulated news. Right? And there are many, many native um, newspapers throughout the United States. The first recovered one is, goes back to the Cherokee in 1828. Um, 
But during, between 1828 and 1860, there are at least 15 exclusively native newspapers um, that carry on, again, this tradition of circulating news in a native way to native communities. So in 1923, when A&B and began publishing their own newspaper, the Alaska Fisherman, which seems to be the earliest native newspaper in southeast Alaska. Maybe someone can correct me. That's the earliest one I've been able to find. Um, not direct, that's not directly affiliated with a federal school. They did so within a long-standing indigenous literary tradition of sharing and disseminating news, ideas, and knowledge. The medium had changed, and the audience had to also include non-native readers. But like their indigenous, indigenous literary progenitors, a and ANS published and circulated the Alaska Fisherman, as well as the later Alaskan, as a similar tool to build community, collect Alaska natives, or connect Alaska natives across the southeast, as well as submit their collective voice into the greater non-native public discourse. These often overlooked collectivists, I'm going to con conclude with this, hopefully we have a little bit of time, maybe not. Um, these often overlooked collectivist literatures of indigenous nations and networks are many of, quote, the words that could set indigenous people's creative deliberation into motion. They are the kinetic words that resist a colonial narrative that continues to render indigenous peoples as static. A brief look at the minutes of just one of many, many um, annual convention minutes makes this uh, very clear. Each page is full of various motions until what seems like a conventional formality begins to make clear the understated reality that Alaska Native peoples have always been in motion. Composed because of and in order to enable ongoing indigenous motion, these collectivist literatures are the words that evidence communal solidarity rather than displacement and alienation which is that time period's big narrative, the official US narrative of Native America. And returning to our introductory epigraphs, collectivist literatures like the Constitution, the Petition, the newspapers, and the many other writings of A&B ANS are the words that have been and continue to be published to preserve and protect the literatures, the lives, and the lands of indigenous peoples. Thank you. Or any feedback of any sort. This is my question. Uh, two very well-known writers mm -hmm. of Alaska Native history, Peter Metcalf and Kim Metcalf, mm -hmm. who will be recognized in the Filipino community. And I really want to thank you for giving this presentation. Your work is and effort is very extensive, and uh, we hear your words. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I've, I've, Peter and Kim's work has influenced much of what I've done and informed the history of, of the literature. That I'm going at the literary um, avenue, and they've done the, 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 his, the historical um, telling of Alaska Native history, or the history of the ANBA and S. So I'm very indebted to them. Hi, I thank you for sharing your paper. I enjoyed listening to how well you put it together. However, I was really surprised at my reaction to some of the uh, information that it gave. Mm -hmm. uh, it triggered in me some anger and some sadness. Mm -hmm. But, um, and as you kept going on and on with it, I can understand where you were going with the paper. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, that brings up a very good point, because obviously much of the history of indigenous peoples is rooted in this anger and sadness caused by colonizers, right? My point is to show that through this anger and sadness, indigenous peoples and Alaska Natives specifically for this paper came together and channeled that anger and sadness into something very productive, right? That it's choice and not victimhood. And hopefully that came across. <laughs>
Carol, yeah. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for your work and tell you that you've got a lot more work to do. Good. But I want you to do a lot more. <laughs> it's very provocative, mm -hmm. really pro provocative. But when I think about all of the other work that needs to be done, it's interrelating it to um, all of the other components of our history and culture. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I puzzled and puzzled over that preamble. I mean, I hated it. I absolutely <laughs> hated it. And uh, I... And, and and I was a young lady when I got involved in A&S, and, and, mm -hmm. and I told um, John Hope, I said, we've got to change that preamble. And he said, Rosita, you do not understand, you know, the, the history behind it. Mm -hmm. And um, um, and I, I think slowly I began to understand, you know, where they were coming from. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't... I, I, I just kind of want to explain that, but I don't want to get away from your, you know, your your thesis and your work, mm -hmm. of, you know, literary uh, works and what we and what we need to do to tie it back to some of the oral tradition. Um, but just to finish off on mm -hmm. that, you know, I finally came to the conclusion, and I and I kind of think I'm right from what I'm learning uh, in my continued study since the 1960s. Mm -hmm. is that they were looking for us to to get the the tools that we needed to protect ourselves. Mm -hmm. And when and when you look at their early work and their early leaders is that their early work that they were doing was not on land mm -hmm. specifically because I, I did a study of leadership and when I was looking at the traditional leadership, the clans they were always talking about land. Mm -hmm. 1912 comes, they organize the A and B, and they talk about, you know, learning to speak English, getting educated. They mm -hmm. were looking for the tools that we needed in order to survive. There's another interesting thing that I wonder, it was, was it really a strategy? Is where they were, they, they, we, all, we still had clan leaders, mm -hmm. and they would touch base with the clan leaders. Uh, and uh, they, they, even though they knew they said we have to speak English, they gave deference to the clan leaders who continued to speak English. Mm -hmm. And just yesterday I read something by Paul Jackson where he said that it was a specific, he suggested it was a specific strategy that part of our people would become educated in the Western way, but we would still keep our traditional leaders mm -hmm. uh, who would then come back and educate us at in, during this time period. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm doing uh, some work on canoe projects, and he said that they were the educators. So these people who continued our traditional practices, they would become the educators in this time and era. And you see it right now in the works of you know SHI that we have a traditional scholars council. They are becoming the leaders. Those that mm -hmm. didn't embrace embrace. Um, uh, westernization or assimilation or English, but it was those early leaders that really, I think, they were brilliant in terms of seeing that we needed to have those tools uh, in order for us to survive, mm -hmm. because it's still something that we can we continue today. We really prize education, mm -hmm. but you could see everything now is integrating our, our, our knowledge into the educational system. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking about your work in terms of, you know, how do we, you know, how do we come to a better understanding of our history? And I think your work is something new. Mm -hmm. I mean, it takes a very different approach than what I think Dick and Nora did. Yeah. Uh, Dick and Nora, did, you know, that was, their work was great. But I think you come in and bring something that I think will help us understand our history better. Mm -hmm. But I think it's got to be interrelated to, I mean, you know, I saw all that motions over there. So you need to understand our social structure. Yeah, totally. And and how that how Robert rules of order just you know we it break it we, it fit us it was perfect. Mm -hmm. So I guess my my only uh, wish and hope is that you'll continue <coughs> your work in this area, mm -hmm. and um, and that we have the opportunity for you to teach. I think you know I think if we had some courses in this area, it would help our younger folks you know uh, to to learn this approach, but then I think we need to think about how we integrate it with some of the other aspects of our, our history yeah. and our culture. Thank you, Rosita. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you. I gotta go pick a grandchild now. <laughs> <laughs> yes.
Well, I just want to compliment you on an uh, uh, interesting, provocative <coughs> presentation, and thank you for mentioning Andy Hope. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of a sad anniversary of his passing uh, in, uh, on this day in 2008, and he had great influence on my career. And unfortunately, Rosita has, uh, has left, but I wanted to thank uh, the Sea Alaska Heritage Foundation for creating this facility. Mm -hmm. Some of the documents that you showed here, I read about secondhand, but it's the first time I've seen it, and by virtue of having an archive, a central archive, mm -hmm. give uh, researchers like me a better access. Very much appreciate that. Yeah, it's incredible. And to note to that, for anyone who is interested, in the near future, I'm going to share. I've kind of noted what I've found. Some of the some of the, some of the collections are very nicely itemized, very um, methodical, and you can find what you're looking for. And others just kind of give the dates. And so I haven't itemized everything I've gone through, but I've itemized what I've um, found as being very interesting that influenced my work that I'm going to use in my work, um, or even some of the bigger publications of A and B, A and S, or the bigger letters that got circulated, so that those will then enter the online catalog. So you can find those without having to search through thousands of pages between a 20 year date and a folder or something. So hopefully that is also helpful. That's one of the ongoing works in the archive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Improve finding aids and details. Yeah, exactly. Things, and that takes that's an ongoing effort that yeah. we're doing here. But um, yeah, I'd like to thank you as well. I think I think it is you've given sort of opened up some new ideas and ways of looking at things, which is always helpful. Mm -hmm. um, one suggestion I have you might and you might have already thought about this is looking earlier than A and B mm -hmm. petitions. You know, there are petitions written right after you know to the president. Mm -hmm. Right after 1867, there were gatherings of clan leaders at that time when, when, when the U.S. acquired the Soviet Union, that they were, I mean, um, acquired Alaska. And there was, um, you know, sometimes through the Russian American church that helped people in Sitka write these petitions. But mm -hmm. uh, the, the idea of collective action goes, goes to the earliest time of, of contact with mm -hmm. the Russian no, I would maybe we can talk later through email um, of, of some of those examples because I kept turning to the great law today because it's kind of the as far as the general Native American narrative, it's the earliest document of collective um, organization, right? Um, but as I do my project, it would be really nice to have some local specific ones that that um, go back further than the organizations themselves. So yeah, I'll. Email you and hopefully get an idea or two. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's connection to the Great Law. I mean, I used to work in the Northeast, so I'm very familiar with all that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, there's also the tradition of comparative literature, mm -hmm. which it sounds like you're part of or, or connected with, and that's where there are similar things, but that sound like they come from the same, you know, connection. Mm -hmm. But maybe, maybe they're independent inventions. As an anthropologist, we speak of independent inventions. Yeah, they could be. Or independently developed in different areas that aren't connected, mm -hmm. but become sim but are similar. You know, similar strategies and all. And that yeah. Might be, you know, although they they share similarities, they're different. Yeah, there are the, the two different approaches to that because the one idea is mm -hmm. there's an assumption that indigenous communities are not have not always been interconnected with each other, right? And finding, for example, the National Council of American Indians, the president traveled 15,000 miles in the first summer alone. In 1926, she and others traveled across the United States community to community, giving out their petitions, their constitutions, collecting what was going wrong in their locality so they could go back to D.C. and lobby. They were also connected with, like I um, said, Samuel Davis here in Alaska. But my part of my project is also tracing that these networks have existed. So the assumption that that some sort of networking hasn't always existed is is a colonial assumption, right? But whether or not that was a literary, um, whether that that was a literary network always is a is kind of a you know a guess, um, but hopefully a productive one. Yeah. Thanks, Chuck. <laughs>